and president of the International Commission of Relations. Um, she has done much research on vitamin D and UV radiation, and she did a study a few years ago involving my high uh, MGS and Wittington students. So, uh, without further ado, can you please welcome Professor Hart? But before I start, we're going to see if we can make the technology work. I do apologise if any of you don't have clickers. I was given an approximate number, I brought a few more clickers, but clearly it's a sellout tonight. So, very sorry if you don't have one. Could you take that little handset you've got in front of you and just press the top middle button that says menu and then afterwards press no. It should come up and say something about channel 41 and then it'll go blank again. If you've done that, everything's working. Okay. So, menu in the middle, press no, it should say something about channel 41 and then it goes blank. Yeah? So, I'm going to be asking you some questions as we go through and we're going to use the clickers to answer them and it's a bit like ask the audience on who wants to be a millionaire and the answers should come up on the screen. I'm keeping my fingers crossed it will all work. So, as you've heard, um, I'm from the University of Manchester, I'm a professor of atmospheric sciences, and you might say, well what's that got to do with skeletons and, and sardines? And as you've already heard, the answer is of course vitamin D, but I thought just for two minutes I'd tell you how I got to be working on vitamin D when I started off in atmospheric sciences, so you know who you're talking to or who's talking to you, and then we'll carry on with the talk. Okay, so I came to vitamin D and everything through sunlight. I started off studying physics when I was at, at university. I decided I'd like to do physics and meteorology, right, so the, the study of weather. So I went to Reading University, which at the time was right next to the meteorological office, so a really good place to be doing that. And I studied the weather. But rather than going on and to become a, a TV weather forecaster, like some of my fellow students, I went off and did some research, and I was studying sunlight. So it's a really good thing to study if you want to go in nice warm places. Uh, and that took me on to an invitation to go to the United States and do some work there in Boston, uh, because there was a gentleman there who did a lot of work on vitamin D, but always in the lab. He knew that sunlight was important for vitamin D. He wanted someone to, to sort of put some reality into his work and to take it outside and put it in the sunlight. So I spent some years in, in the US doing that, being their photophysicist or all sorts of other things they used to call me in the hospital, but their photophysicist. Um, and then I came back to, to the UK and went back more to do meteorology. So, um, still working with the sun, still working with radiation, and that uh, has enabled me to go all around the world. I've been to the Arctic, I've been to um, the top of mountains, I've been to nice Greek islands to look at eclipses. Uh, I've used longer wavelength radiation to look at uh, things like surface temperatures to do some remote sensing, uh, flying our little uh, atmospheric aircraft. So that was fun, whizzing around over the top of Manchester and measuring the temperature of the surface. And you can see as you come down the Mersey in Liverpool, that's all nice and cold compared with the, the ground surface roundabout on a summer's afternoon. But a lot of my work has been concerned with the ultraviolet end of the spectrum. So that's the shortest wavelength, um, the, the part of the spectrum with the most energy, if you're thinking about photons of, of radiation. And it has a lot of biological effects. The one you're probably most familiar with is sunburn, down in the bottom right-hand corner there. I expect you've seen on TV or read in magazines that you shouldn't go out and get a sunburn in the summer, that you should put your sunscreen on, that you should be careful. And that's all very true. Um, UV radiation is officially a carcinogen. But it also has some beneficial effects, and if we don't have any of it, that can also cause some problems. And so that was one of the things that we were looking at, the beneficial effects of UV radiation, because 
When it hits your skin, your skin will make vitamin D. Yeah. So, apart from the questions of, well, how much sunlight do you need and how much vitamin D do you need, we thought a good place to start would be to find out how much vitamin D people in Manchester actually have and how they get it. Do they get it through their diet? And we'll look at uh, the, the dietary components that will give you vitamin D. Or do they get it through sunlight? <coughs> or is it a bit of both? And what sort of levels do people have in Manchester? So we did some work with um, both adults and adolescents. And pupils from all your schools helped us with that. We did the studies um, a few years ago. Well, the first one was a few years ago. Um, the other one we finished last year, and we're now analysing the results from those studies. So uh, I'm going to show you some of those results today. So let's start out with um, seeing if we can make the technology work. And just I'm going to ask you a few questions, not to preempt your answers by giving you my talk first. I'm going to ask you some questions first, and then. I'm going to give you a bit more information and you'll see why the questions were important. So, just an easy one, this isn't especially important, but just to, to get you going, hopefully something that you can all answer without any problem at all. Are you male or female? Alright, alright, so, I'm going to start the polling now, and I'd just like you, I'd just like you to press the button, okay, press your button now, are you male or female? Just the 
almost 200 years ago when vitamin D was first recognized, not at that time as vitamin D, but there was a realization from a Polish physician working in Warsaw that sunlight seemed to be important for strong bones, or at least for avoiding the disease of deficiency, which in children is rickets. And you can see this picture at the bottom is children with rickets. You get um, deformed skeleton, either not knees or bow legs. You get what you, is called a rickitic rosary, which is sort of bulges on your rib cage. Um, and generally weak, malformed bones. And so the Polish physician realized that children who got a lot of sun didn't have rickets, and children who didn't have any sun seemed to be more susceptible to rickets. And then towards the end of the 1800s, in 1889, the British Medical Association published a paper saying there seems to be a difference in in the number of children who get rickets between those who live in rural areas, so out in the farm, doing all the farming, and those who live in inner cities. And this was at the time of industrialization when children were coming into the inner cities, working in mills, here in Manchester in the cotton mills, um, spending all their time inside and in the sort of dark satanic mills that Lowry was painting. Then there was a, um, another physician who went off to India, time of the British Empire, and he realized that the children in India also didn't get rickets, even though in many ways they were much poorer than children in the industrialized England. So he also hypothesized that it was sunlight that was the difference. It was much sunnier in India than it was in England. Finally, at the beginning of the 20th century came the proof <coughs> that UV could cure rickets. So now people knew that, that you could actually cure rickets by giving people UV radiation. And indeed, uh, they used to sit children around UV lamps um, until quite recently. They used to do that in Russia. I know people from Russia who said, when I was a child, I had to sit around a UV lamp to keep my bones strong. It's maybe something that we wouldn't do today, knowing what we do about UV radiation being a carcinogen, but it's about finding a balance. About the same time, about the start of the 20th century, people found that there was also a dietary cure for rickets. At first, they thought it was vitamin A, but then they found that cod liver oil could cure rickets, and finally, vitamin D was, was recognized, was discovered, and the two sources of the vitamins for our body were identified as ultraviolet radiation on your skin, and your skin then makes vitamin D, and through the diet. So, sunlight was important, diet is also important. The main <coughs> dietary source of vitamin D is, is fatty fish. You also find it a little bit in eggs and in red meat. Uh, but the biggest dietary source is fatty fish. So, today, things have cleaned up a bit. There's Lowry's Salford Keys. This is more what it looks like today. Nice and clean. No more dark satanic mills in Manchester. They've all gone. So why are we worried about rickets and vitamin D today? Well, the thing is, it hasn't entirely gone. Right? This, as you can tell, is a much more modern picture of a little girl showing signs of rickets. And rickets has become somewhat more prevalent um, in the UK and also in, in other parts of the world. It seems to be increasing again. Not to epidemic proportions, but nonetheless, why would that be? in our modern, healthy, clean lifestyle. You don't have to spend 15 hours a day working in a cotton mill, do you? So why would there be a problem today? The other thing is that there's some evidence that there might be a lot of other health benefits to vitamin D. It's not a cure for any of these things, but there is some evidence that it <coughs> might be protective against a lot of other things like internal cancers, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, a lot of the, the scourges, if you like, of, of the modern medical world. 
It is what you would might call, if you're in a court of law, circumstantial evidence. Right? It's very difficult to get direct proof that something can protect against these things. Um, but it does show up in many, many epidemiological studies that in places where there's more sunlight, more UV radiation, where people get more exposure, the incidences of these sorts of diseases are lower. It's not to say it has to be vitamin D, but uh, there's a, a lot of work that's been done that shows it could be. We know, for example, that vitamin D, or the active form of vitamin D, is what's called antiproliferative. So it stops cells multiplying, stops them proliferating. And of course, the cancer is really just cells proliferating out of control. So there's an argument that it might help. So put all these things together, and the medical community, uh, certainly in some parts of the world, is recommending that people take much higher doses or, or have much higher levels of vitamin D than previously. And at the moment, uh, the UK Department of Health and the, the Scientific Advisory um, Committee on Nutrition are looking very much at this now, vitamin D. And it's this work and the work that you've done that's helping to feed into that. So, how much vitamin D do people have today? And where do they get it from? That was the question that we were asking of these different groups, different parts of the population in Manchester. So, okay, this is where our vitamin D comes from. It can come through the skin, or it can come from the diet. And that's and at that point, that those input points, we have what we call vitamin D. <coughs> it then goes to the liver. And in the liver, it's hydroxylated to something called 25-hydroxyvitamin D. And that's what we measure when we want to know your vitamin D status. It's a 25-hydroxyvitamin D that we measure. After that, it goes to the kidney. And that's where we get the active form, which is one called 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. <coughs> and that's the thing that, that um, helps to take calcium out of the gut and to help to build your bones but it's very, very tightly controlled by other hormones and by the endocrine system. So it's the 25-hydroxyvitamin D that responds to the inputs that we're going to look at. The bit in the middle, you don't have to worry about all of that, but this top bit's what happens in the skin. You have, in your skin you have a precursor that's called 70-hydrocholesterol, and like the, the name suggests, it's a form of cholesterol. So it's just sitting there in your skin. When it's irradiated with UV radiation, with very short wavelength radiation, with a lot of energy, then it can be changed into something called pre-vitamin D. Right? For any chemists amongst you, that involves a ring opening, which you might be able to see on the diagram. Right? After that, it's a slow heat process at body temperature that changes it into vitamin D in your skin. So we've now got vitamin D sitting in the skin and it can be picked up by something called D-banding protein and taken away in the blood to all these other things, uh, to, to the liver and then to the kidney. And I just want you to look at <coughs> vitamin pink off there on the left. That's a really, really clever feedback mechanism that prevents you from overdosing yourself on vitamin D by going out in the sun. Because once you get some of that pre-vitamin D, sunlight can change that either back to the precursor or to two other things called tocistrol and lamistrol, which as far as we know don't do anything. If you like, they're waste products. But they stop too much pre-vitamin D building up in your skin, making too much vitamin D and then causing you a problem because in excess, in real excess, it can be quite toxic. It's not, not good for you if you take masses too much. <coughs> and you can't, by, by going out in the sun, you can't get too much vitamin D because of this really clever feedback effect. Okay. So, what did we do in our study? We measured the vitamin D levels of people in the blood. We measured the circulating 25-hydroxyvitamin D once every season. Right, so in spring, summer, autumn, winter. <coughs> Each 
each, for a week in each season, we measured people's dietary intake. We asked them to keep a food log and tell us everything that they were eating that might have vitamin D in it, and also whether they were taking any supplements. Then we measured their exposure to sunlight, it, specifically the UV part of sunlight using a dosimeter badge. And we also asked them to fill in an exposure diary for one or two weeks per, se per season, telling us when they'd been outside what they were wearing and whether they were wearing sunscreen or not. Right? And they did that again for a week each season. And we've done that in quite a lot of different groups of people. We've done it in white Caucasian adults and adolescents, thank you. Uh, in South Asian adults and adolescents, thank you. And in photosensitive adults, so those who've, who've got a condition that makes their skin very sensitive to the sun, so they would tend not to, or choose not to go out of the sun. So here is a carefully modelled polycellophone badge, okay, um, on some lovely girl from Manchester High School. Um, and here is one of our adult volunteers. You can see he's wearing the second badge. That was a, a recording just that, that, that would tell us exactly when he was outside. But we only had a very few of those. Um, and so... Uh, <coughs> Um, we, we didn't use them for the, the studies with, with the adolescents, we just used them on a few of the adults. So that was how we were measuring um, the UV radiation. And you might have worn them yourself, I remember seeing people with those little badges on occasionally. So we've got UV, we've got diet, and we've got vitamin D levels. Okay, so in terms of dietary intake first, all right, currently this country has no recommended daily allowance for vitamin D from school age to retirement. They say, that the, the dietary guidelines say, that we should get adequate vitamin D from exposure to sunlight. But nonetheless, you can get it from your diet. So we wanted to find out how much vitamin D people were actually ingesting. Right? And from whatever it is that you eat, um, these are the, the, the results. These are the, this is the annual intake in micrograms per day. We didn't find really any difference in season. There was no seasonal effect of people's intake. Um, and we found that the, the white adults had the most intake, but it's still not very much. All right? For those parts of the population where we do recommend dietary intake of vitamin D, so um, for very young children, for the more elderly part of the population, for pregnant women, um, then usually it's about 400 international units per day right, that's recommended. So you can see we're getting nowhere near that. Even the white Caucasian adults are only taking about 120 international units a day. In the United States and Canada, they're now recommending about 1,000 IU a day. So, nowhere near that at all. You can see that um, our Asian adults in, took in less um, vitamin D. They, they tended to be more vegetarians in that group, so they wouldn't be eating the fish and the meat and, the, and maybe not the eggs, which are the main sources of vitamin D. Adolescents, the white Caucasian adolescents, mm, well, don't know there's very much vitamin D in pizza and chips, actually. So, the intake there was also quite low. This is an average over the, the over 100 people, about 125 people that we had. So, for some people it was higher, for some it was lower. Right? And the photosensitive um, adults were very similar to the, to the white adults, taking about the IU per day. So, there's no recommended daily allowance, and it's true, we don't seem to get very much vitamin D from our diet. If you wanted to increase it, You'd have to start having a nice portion of salmon every day for your lunch. Um, there, as I say, there is some in eggs and in red meat, but you have to eat a lot of eggs and all the red meat to get your um, recommended daily intake of vitamin D. Some areas of the world you get fortification. Milk, for example, in the United States is fortified with vitamin D. It isn't usually here in the UK. So, cross-off diet is not a tremendously good source. So, let's think then about sunlight, right? The Department of Health says we get our vitamin D from sunlight. D 
do we go out in the sunlight enough and is that true? Get your cookies out. Right. So, I want you to think about the school week. Think about the school week, especially in the summer term. Don't bother thinking about, you know, the, the, the schools around the school now until Christmas because it's cold and it's dark and it's many Think about the school week. What do you do at lunchtime? Typically in the summer term at school, would you go outside most days? Go outside sometimes? Usually stay indoors? Or do you almost always stay indoors? Nobody knows who's got what clicker, so just answer. <laughs> So that's almost easy. 
got a whole range. It's got just the
And if you wear sunscreen, and if you wear moisturizers with an SPF factor, then you're reducing the amount of UV radiation getting to your skin. That's what they're designed to do. So they'll stop you getting sunburn, and in the case of moisturizers, the plan is they stop you getting all wrinkly and crinkly. Um, but they will also reduce the amount of vitamin D you make. Okay, so what did we find? This is the sort of exposure that we found our adolescents were getting. And I'm showing you all the data here. So people wore two badges, one for weekdays, <coughs> then when you're at school, and one for weekends. And we had two groups. We had our white Caucasian adolescents and our South Asian adolescents. That's us with what we call, dermatologically, it's called skin type five. So when you've got brown skin, essentially, constitutive pigment that's always there. Right. So you can see that during the weekdays, the exposure is very similar for both groups. Right? The, the, um, uh, the blue and the green bars distinguish between the, the South Asian and the White Caucasian adolescents. And that's, you'd expect that because you're all at school, you're all doing the same things, you all have lunchtime at the same time, you all have games together, right? So very, very similar um, and quite well grouped um, during the weekday. Uh, weekends, that's the black dot, you can see that the average, the, the, the green and blue bars are the median for the whole set of people, there are over 100 in each group. So the medians are much, much lower at the weekends. And we hypothesized that quite a lot of teenagers would spend quite a lot of time in bed at the weekends. And you've helped me to show that, that certainly for a proportion of you that is indeed true. Okay. Um, so notice this is on a logarithmic scale here up the side, so it covers several decades of exposure, and, and I've plotted it like this so that you can get, you can see everybody's results. If I put it on a linear scale, I'm going to show you some on a linear scale in a minute. You'll see that a lot of them clump up right at the bottom. Okay. So weekdays seem to be when you get. Your, your, most of your exposure. Although, remember that the, the weekday results are for five days and the weekend is only for two days. And we still get some people, those active people who go outside all the time at weekends, they're getting as, as much exposure at the weekend as they do over the five weekdays. Okay. This is a linear plot, and this shows results from several of our other studies. So the dots here are actually for adults. <coughs> They're for the white Caucasian adults. And the blue and the, the red bars there are just the medians for that group of people. The green bars are for the white Caucasian adolescents. And the orange bars are for the South Asian adolescents. Right? During the week, as you saw before, the, the two bars sit on top of each other, so the green bar represents both, more or less. But at the weekends, the exposure, really obviously here, adolescents are getting much less exposure at weekends than the adults. Okay. There is a bit of a rider here in that these were all done in different years. And I know, for example, that this April weekend was beautiful weather with the adults, whereas one of the June weekends was really quite nasty, July weekends was really quite nasty and horrible. Right? So weather does play a role in this. Everybody's got really low exposure in January. Don't worry about getting vitamin D in January. You won't make any. It doesn't matter. Stay indoors, stay warm. Okay. <laughs> but you, get, you make your vitamin D during the summer, and you need to make enough to last you through the winter. Right? So. We do get exposure, you get exposure, most of it, for many of you, during the weekday when you're at school. So what does that do for your vitamin D levels? Okay. Here are the vitamin D levels by season for the adolescents. Okay. And again, the bars are the medians, the green bars are the white Caucasian, the blue bars are the South Asian adolescents. Right. 
And you can see that throughout the year, there is a change. Everybody goes up in summer, that's good. You're all going out, you're all getting some exposure. And then uh, comes down again in winter. The maximum is in autumn, it's actually about September. Right? And we found that in the adults as well, for the white Caucasian adults. For the South Asians, the, the peak tends to be around sort of July, August time. And even though you're getting the same exposure, the levels are quite a lot lower for the South Asian adolescents. Now, why would that be? Pigment. I heard someone say it over here. Pigment. Pigment, that's right. That's right. The pigment in your skin, the melanin, is your natural sunscreen. Right? So it absorbs UV radiation. That's its job. So if you've got skin type 5 or skin type 6 and you've naturally got more pigment, pigment you're going to need a lot more sun to make the same amount of vitamin D. Right? So we found lower levels in our South Asian um, adolescents. And it's, it's kind of what you'd expect to say, yeah, okay, so what? But really no one had ever measured it in this amount of detail before. Everyone says, well, we'd expect that. But no one had actually proved it. So you've helped us very nicely to show that. So if we look at it now compared with the adults, how do you do compared with your parents? <coughs> and we find here that you do better, South Asian adolescents do better than the adults, better than our South Asian adults. Right? Your vitamin D levels are a little bit higher, especially in summer. Right? This, is, this 10 nanograms per mil is a cutoff point where we think that, that above that, you, you, you're kind of doing okay. Below that, you need to be a little bit careful. Right? You, you need to just keep an eye on, on your bone health. Um, and we'll come on to, to what else goes into that in a minute. The, this 20 nanograms per mil, that's where the Americans want people to be at the moment. And it's what our Department of Health is talking about. Should the UK be aiming for that, or do we think 10 is actually quite fine? Um, and we don't have to worry about being at 20 nanograms per mil all the time. For the white Caucasians, right, the adolescents don't have quite as high as, as their parents or as the adults that we had. Right? So um, for the white Caucasians, the adults have slightly higher levels of vitamin D. We've seen that might be a little bit to do with the diet. You saw that they had a higher dietary intake. Uh, whereas the, the um, Asian dietary intake was low. So although it's low, it has a little bit of an effect. Um, and, but I think it's those weekends. I think it's the Saturdays and Sundays in bed that does it, actually, when you're, when you're talking about the difference that we see here. But again, you can see that seasonal change up in the summer, down in the winter. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with all of these, a big variation across our whole population. So we could look at that another way, and we could look at the bands into which we, we see people falling. So you see in winter, people tend to drop, everybody's vitamin D level falls in winter, unless you're taking lots of supplements maybe. Um, and in summer, it goes up and the people above 20 nanograms per mil increase, and the number with low levels decreases. It's a little bit of a different picture with our South Asian adolescent status by season. Many more of those in that lower band. I'm not saying it's terribly bad to be there, all right? But it would be better to be a little bit higher. So, what are we doing about that? I don't want you all running out of here terrified and going, "Oh my goodness, I might have been one of those doctors that would be below ten nanograms per mil." All right. We are taking care of that. We have a duty of care to you. Um, it was it was part of our protocol for these studies. For the white Caucasian study, which has been completed for a number of years now, we went back and we contacted all the GPs for those who had low vitamin D levels in the study. They were offered a consultation with a paediatrician and a bone scan, and all the bone scans were normal, albeit some of them were in a sort of low normal range. But they've all had advice, um, and they've all been offered treatment if it was the right thing to do. Okay. South Asian study is still under analysis, but we did some extra things in the South Asian study, and you'll know about those if you're part of it. 
We also looked at dietary calcium because that's really important. If you've got really good levels of dietary calcium, you actually need less vitamin D because you can use some of it anyway. Right? If you've got low calcium and low vitamin D, that's when you maybe start to need to think about making some changes. We also did some jumping mechanography with this group right? because one of the other symptoms of low vitamin D is muscle weakness. And so if you test how well people can jump, you get um, and, uh, some feedback about whether they may be having an issue. Right? And so we're just finishing the analysis of that. And again, we will be contacting GPs of any of the people who we might have any sort of concern with, with the results from this study. So don't want anyone going away worrying about this, all right? You're all going to get exactly what you need. And, and if you've got any concerns from these tests, we will be contacting your GP and making sure that you're absolutely okay. I also don't want you going out and self-medicating, please. You've been told not to do that, I'm sure. So do not go out and get a sunburn. Do not go and say, I need vitamin D, so I'll just lie in the sun. You never need to sunburn to get the vitamin D that you need. I showed you that clever feedback mechanism to stop your body overdosing. Uh, that kicks in really in quite a short time, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so you don't need to get a sunburn to get vitamin D. Little and often, is the secret. A little bit of sun, a few minutes a day at lunchtime, every day will do you much more good than just going out and going, I'm going to sunbathe all day long and get a sunburn once a year. Okay? And of course, that sort of behaviour is really, really bad for you in terms of skin cancer. So, you can increase synthesis in the skin by increasing the area exposed, as we talked about before, and for a short time, not wearing your moisturiser and your sunscreens and everything. Little and often is a secret. In terms of your diet, you would have to eat rather a lot of salmon um, to really significantly increase your vitamin D levels. But nonetheless, it's, a, it's an input in winter when we don't have any respectable sunlight in Manchester. It's our only um, input for vitamin D. So, you know, don't knock the diet, but it would be hard to get everything from the diet. If you do want to go the dietary route, then supplements are much more effective. Mm -hmm. Of course, they cost money. Mm -hmm. yeah. And don't go taking large doses. Okay? If you get a multivitamin or something, then that's fine. Take your one multivitamin, but please don't go taking lots of them, because again, that's bad for you. Um, and if you've got concerns, of course, see your GP. So, the question I always get asked is, how long do I have to go out with No? Good question. This is the hardcore physics now. I'm not going to explain it all to you. Don't be glad to hear. But a lot of physics went into making this map. This is a model that's taken the climatology of the UK. So that's what the weather's been like for 10 years, from 2003 to 2012 including cloud and ozone, right? so using satellite pictures from every single day of what the cloud was like over the whole UK. It's done on a one by one degree grid, so about 60 miles by 60 miles, very roughly. Uh, and for every one of those grid points, we found the cloud and the ozone and everything else. Okay? And then we assumed that you've got 35% skin area exposed, so skirt or shorts and t-shirts. In the summer and in the spring and the autumn, you just had your hands and face exposed to the sun. Right? And we calculated the time you'd need to be outside at lunchtime to get a reasonable um, vitamin D level. And that came from some other work we did with controlled exposures to UV. Right? And so we said, all right, go outside for white Caucasian people, which is a graph on the left, for nine minutes. For the South Asian people, because you have that constitutive pigment, you would have to go outside for longer. It would be about 25 minutes. Still less than the time that you require to get a sunburn. Right? And we put all that data into this model and calculated if you did that, if you went outside for nine minutes every single day, exposing the amount of skin area that I've just said, then this is the dose 
of UV that you would get in, in vitamin D effective units. Okay? And our target from those control studies that we did was that you'd need to get for the white Caucasians, you need to get about 3,800, and you can see that everybody who reached that in the UK was top, maybe very top of the top. Similarly for the South Asians, if you went out for 25 minutes in the same conditions, you would also get there, you'd reach your, your target. So it is possible in the UK to get your vitamin D requirements through sunlight, but you have to think about your exposure. So, as I said at the beginning, this works in forming the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition who are looking at public health recommendations and how to help people balance their diet, going out in the sun, for how long, wearing what, also worrying or, or taking care not to get a sunburn so there's no danger of, of skin cancers. And so, that's where this work is going. Thank you for helping us with it. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you've learned something about vitamin D. I'm happy to answer any questions, but while I do that, my lovely assistants are going to collect in those clickers. So if you could all just pass them in towards the steps. Okay.